Welcome to Postgres Memory Management Journals. I am Krishna Kumar. Uh, you guys, all of you can call me KK. Um, I'll start off uh, with a bit of introduction uh, about myself and how uh, this talk has come about uh, primarily. Um, so I'm engineering manager for uh, Postgres open source contributors and committers team in Microsoft. Um, I started uh, roughly like 22 years back uh, in born into Linux and uh, was doing embedded system porting on things like MIPS and SH4 boards. I don't know how many of you probably are aware of those boards, but um, I know that SH4 support got taken away from Postgres sometime back, so that's uh, when, when all this was going on. Uh, from there, I joined um, uh, HP, uh, worked in high performance computing for a while, scalable file systems, uh, did uh, join a startup of hybrid cloud storage, and it got acquired by Microsoft. Uh, that's how I landed in Microsoft, uh, continued doing uh, storage stuff, slowly moved into Kubernetes side of things for some time, uh, did a lot of open source uh, work around uh, authentication, storage, and things like that uh, on Kubernetes side. Um, in the last three to four years, I was part of the team which built the managed uh, cloud uh, service called Flexible, uh, Azure Flexible uh, Server in, uh, in uh, Azure. So we have a managed offering uh, which I helped build. Um, Recently, uh, roughly like last year, uh, middle, I joined as the engineering manager for uh, contributors and commenters team. Uh, the most exciting part of my uh, job is uh, the people I interact with. And these are the folks who uh, have commit privileges to Postgres, who contribute a lot of code like Thomas Monroe, David Rowley, Daniel Gustafson, Anders uh, Froen, uh, Melanie, Bilal, uh, and Meli. So all of these folks I interact uh, on a day-to-day -day basis as part of my uh, job. Um, so a lot of things I get to learn uh, via them, and this is my attempt to share uh, those learnings with all of you. And as much as this is a learning uh, sharing session, I would like to learn uh, from all of you as well. Um, so continuing on. This is roughly how the talk is structured. We'll quickly touch upon the architecture just in the memory, uh, uh, you know, like context of memory. Uh, we'll talk about how um, Postgres uses the shared aspect of the memory, how between uh, processes it uses those. Then go into a little bit details of um, the types of shared memory that's, that's around uh, uh, in Postgres. Then we'll talk a bit about the local aspects of it, how uh, Postgres, even though really uh, it's written in C, it still offers a sort of library which kind of gives a managed, uh, you know, like language feeling when you write code in Postgres. Um, we'll talk a bit about uh, uh, the kernel interactions that Postgres has. We won't dig deep, but still uh, we'll go through some of those uh, aspects. Uh, then we'll talk a bit about how to debug some of these issues in terms of not bringing many issues into the picture, but just enabling uh, all of you to be aware of these tools and how to use them and things like that. Uh, we'll touch upon configs which matter, uh, and it's not like a comprehensive thing again, it's more like uh, how can we, um, like what, what are the uh, interconnected pieces here with memory uh, and the configurations. Then uh, we'll talk about projects, some of this are currently uh, out there in the mailing list, some, some of this have patches out there, uh, some of them don't have, uh, and some of them is close to my heart, so I just want to talk about it so that, uh, you know, there's more people, if they want to join and collaborate, would like to engage. And then, th as anything else in, in the open source world, uh, nothing stands on its own. It, there's a village behind all of these things. These are learnings from a lot of people. Just want to say thanks at the end to all of them as well. So we'll start off with uh, the usual uh, you know, quote, which is obligatory to put in, that uh, for a long, long time, uh, the, the promise that uh, Postgres at some point will become uh, threading, like will be based on threading. But uh, at this point in time, Postgres is uh, still process-based. There's a lot of momentum, at least around the last year. Uh, we have started seeing more uh, 
focus on uh, making this happen, but you know, it's, it's not uh, really happening uh, for a long time, since 1990 promises at least. Um, so uh, at the end of the day, uh, Postgres is a process-based um, architecture. Uh, Postmaster spins up the rest of the processes, and everything out there is Delta's process. So when new connections come in, there are more processes uh, getting created. And there are like some default ones, a few of them I picked and put it here. So the lot of memory management aspects of Postgres is based on this uh, architectural fundamental, right? Like if we had process, if we had threads, some of them is not needed. If Since we have process, some of them uh, is designed a, a certain way. So that's how uh, this uh, context is uh, uh, important. Uh, so. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, in, in this talk, we'll talk, uh, the structure of this talk is like, we'll talk about the shared uh, memory aspects of it, the shared process, uh, different processes sharing the same memory. We'll talk about local uh, memory aspects and the kernel memory aspects of it. Um, so just, just in terms of, th this is just a PMAP output from one of the Postgres processes just to give you a glimpse into uh, how these shared memory and um, you know like shared memory and uh, local memory appears so in this case like the shared memory uh, we can think of shared memory as static in in the sense that this is not the typical static memory i'm talking about the static here means that when the startup happens you already uh, you know like allocated this memory and then you continue to use it in between the processes and the dynamic side of things is when after you have a certain uh, execution going on. Let's say you had a query which you uh, which Postgres wants to make uh, parallel. At that point, it needs to generate new processes and then uh, have a new shared memory attached to it. So that's the uh, concept of uh, when I'm talking static and dynamic. I just gave it a name. It's not the typical C static dynamic thing, but just so that uh, we are aware in shared memory. So here, uh, the picture uh, that is there, I'll go into details of this later, but just to give you a sense, if you run PMAP, here's how you will uh, typically see this. One of them is uh, you know, static type, which is declared in the beginning, and the other one is like, as we go through, we'll, uh, we'll attach as needed. So um, in, in the static memory side of things, uh, we will talk about how it's created. That is when uh, the startup happens, how it's created, and things like that. We'll talk a bit about how locking is done in this uh, framework because, uh, as you can imagine, the locking will be totally different if we were uh, to do threading. So just want to touch upon that aspect of it, like how locking is done uh, in Postgres within the internals of Postgres. We'll go through some examples. Primarily, we'll go dig a bit on what buffer pool is and how it's managed and things like that and what could uh, potentially be the uh, enhancements that we could make in that area. Uh, we'll quickly, briefly look at like SLRU and wall buffers, but uh, primarily uh, we'll dig more into the buffer pool side of things. So um, at some point in time, Postgres used to be system five uh, memory, uh, shared memory mapping, like that's what it used to use. Uh, over course of time, we have gotten to a point that there's a little bit of memory that we use uh, in, uh, like, uh, with System 5 uh, memory for making sure that there's no two processes which are running at the same time or two startups which are happening. But outside that, everything has become uh, more and more of uh, a map uh, stuff and anonymous uh, yeah. allocations. So, uh, as you can see in this address space, the the mapped uh, shared uh, memory that we have, uh, which is uh, like typically if you take a file and then memory map, that's what generally you do. But in this case, we don't have a backed one. We have anonymous uh, memory that we map. We map this area, uh, give the shared flag, attach it to the primary uh, process, right, the postmaster. So from here on, anytime there is someone, uh, some process which forks, it also gets this address space uh, with it, which means that it will get access to the shared memory, and then from then on, it gets, uh, you know, gets to use these uh, areas. So um, that, that's, the, uh, that's the way in which the shared memory is created, and that's the uh, way in which uh, fork happens. 
You have multiple choices. If you want, you can go back. But typically, this MMAP uh, system is what uh, default comes, and most of the times, uh, uh, we end up using this. Um, I just want to touch upon a bit here. Typical allocations you can do with uh, regular memory, but if you have a huge TLB and huge pages enabled in your system, you can use those uh, flags. Uh, I'll talk about the configuration in a bit, but you can use those to make sure that this memory is uh, you know, allocated in the huge pages as well. Um, so that's the creation part and how uh, the child processes and rest of them uh, get it. Um, like as promised, we'll look at locking a bit. So uh, because this is shared area, there's a lot of back and forth that happens between these processes. And uh, locking, as you can imagine, is one of those uh, things that we really need uh, to happen when, when we are coding in this space. So in, um, in um, the, just to give the context, this is not the row locking or a transaction locking that I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the lightweight locking, which you use when you are uh, coding inside an extension or inside uh, Postgres. So uh, lightweight locks are implemented in a very uh, straightforward fashion, uh, although as you get into the uh, nitty gritty, it becomes complicated. But uh, the way that this happens is uh, first, uh, there is atomic operations uh, that's possible on the memory. So you use that to lock the memory. If, if attempt fails, then you get into the what is shown in this uh, picture, the, the slow path, wherein you first, uh, the, the process first puts itself into a queue, then it tries to uh, lock again. If it doesn't work, it will wait. And in Postgres, currently, we use semaphores to kind of like make sure that all of them uh, are waiting on the semaphore. And when unlock happens, we go and like wake the rest of them up uh, to see uh, if, they, uh, if they can lock uh, again. Um, the, the, the currently, we use semaphores, but there are uh, proposals around where whether we could use the more modern uh, stuff like few texts and stuff like that. So one thing that I missed mentioning was that the whole talk is about how Postgres is done on Linux, not on other operating systems. So that's why I'm using few texts and other uh, things, just so that we have the setting. But uh, in in uh, one possibility is that instead of using semaphores, can we use something like few texts? Uh, semaphores itself in Linux is implemented uh, on top of the few text system calls nowadays. So there is, uh, you know, there is uh, trade-offs around that. But in general, the, the process is, it depends on the atomic locking and it depends on the semaphore uh, as well. And there is a wake-up process that it goes through in locking. So this is how uh, the locks are designed and this is what uh, gets used when uh, Postgres uh, processes have to communicate uh, between each other. Uh, a bit of uh, detail uh, around this that like it, it doesn't have sophisticated things like deadlock detection and things like that. So when you are dealing with this, uh, please be aware of those things so that you, uh, you know, as a programmer, you have to deal with those things. Uh, there is shared and exclusive mode uh, in this locking available. Uh, and typically in literature, uh, the latch is what uh, folks use. So, but I'm, I'm just calling it lock because of the name of the functions. Uh, and a lot of this is like in the short-lived situation, like I was saying, uh, a lightweight uh, locking scenario. Um, so that's about, so we covered uh, the uh, shared memory aspect of it, how it's created. Now we talked about locking a bit. We'll go into one of the examples um, that uh, is uh, front and center of a lot of uh, usage of this. Um, so um, Postgres, as you can imagine, um, needs to be performant. So anything uh, we access from the disk, we want to be able to cache it. Also, we don't want to operate, uh, we, we want to make sure that we operate more efficiently, which, which means we have something called buffer pool in Postgres. And this buffer pool is implemented on top of the shared uh, memory uh, that is there and statically declared one. And here, um, the entire uh, buffer pool allocation uh, is done into blocks of various, uh, you know, blocks of sizes. And then there is like descriptors which are defined on top of it, which is just like metadata for each of these uh, blocks. Um, a uh, lot of times, this particular buffer pool uh, that we have in Postgres is optimized uh, to 
get to a place where we have the most recently uh, most recently used uh, like page as well as the most frequently used page itself so it's a uh, give and take uh, kind of scenario where we have to balance these things out but at the end of the day uh, currently postgres users are very um, let's say it, it it was somewhere i think in the 1960s or so the the uh, page replacement algorithm that's there uh, i'll give a brief about that like uh, effectively we do something called a clock sweep where every time we need to evict a page from this buffer we go around uh, in the uh, through the buffer so it 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 the ring buffer actually doesn't exist, but based on the descriptors, we go through uh, this buffer. And then we keep reducing the uh, usage of this, uh, 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 like each of these block buffers. If it gets to zero, then we can evict it because recently nobody has come and updated it. So that's kind of the basic logic that we have. Uh, and there are a bunch of discussions around this on whether we can improve uh, this, uh, this part of it. Um, but uh, right now, uh, we still are using the clock sweep algorithm. One challenge with this is that uh, in Postgres, there is a lot of uh, act activities which could actually uh, trash the entire buffer, like vacuum and sequential scan is a two set of uh, such things, where if we start doing the sequential scan, we could actually just fill it up the entire uh, buffer pool and trash the regular uh, rest of the IO uh, patterns that were there. So in that context, we call use something called buffer strategy control, wherein fix a set of blocks from this uh, block uh, buffer blocks that are there are the only ones that uh, we can touch. So which means that when vacuum comes up and tries to do some of these reads, we do this buffer strategy. So it doesn't go and uncontrollably uh, trash the entire buffer pool. It gets a fixed size uh, that it can operate on. So that is how we uh, tend to make, uh, Postgres tends to make the, uh, the scanning, uh, like uh, Postgres tends to make the uh, scan resistance uh, in this buffer pool. But uh, at some point in time, uh, a sophisticated algorithm probably Something like uh, CAR, which has built-in uh, scan uh, resistance, could uh, help here as well. Uh, but overall, um, the theme to take away is that the shared memory that we have here is used for buffering the contents from the disk. And uh, we do have a page replacement and clock CV algorithm uh, built-in into this. So just to give a... Um, you know, like a picture here. Uh, this uh, this is the buffer full content, how it looks like. Uh, so one thing that I didn't quite touch upon was there's this buffer hash table. So whenever we have a need for uh, the buffer, we need to uh, we we need an easy way to look up uh, the buffer. Uh, so if you look at the buffer pool, the rel file node and like these IDs, right? The five IDs after buffer ID, uh, those are the ones which are used to uh, map in that buffer hash table. Because of that, uh, we have a very fast lookup mechanism as well. We use this five tuples, look up the uh, table, and then figure out the blocks from which we access. In general, in the operations that we deal with, and that's, uh, that's an optimization uh, we have as well. Uh, the rest of it is all like, uh, this is from a table which, uh, which I recently populated. So as you can see, there are fields which says whether this buffer block is uh, dirty, uh, the buffer IDs of this, and a bunch of these other values that are required uh, to uh, maintain the buffer pool. The other uh, parts of this is, uh, th there are many of the uh, things which use this uh, shared uh, memory, uh, wall buffer being one of them, uh, SLRU is another thing which is which again uses a page replacement algorithm and there's a lot of discussion go, which has happened in the past on whether the SLRUs can go into the buffer pool itself because they kind of uh, solve the same problem but in a different way. Uh, can we enhance that to uh, focus on one, uh, one uh, algorithm or usage is another thing. So just laying out, these are the other SLRUs uh, which are there, uh, which, we, uh, which we use in the shared memory uh, as well. Um, before I move on to the dynamic part of it, uh, any questions? Folks have? 
Yes. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. but I I will get back to you because I know someone who really knows this. Tom, yeah, Thomas Mandro knows. <laughs> Thomas Mandro, like he knows it. I mean, like it's not like he's working on that, but he knows all of these details. So, um. Di uh, one? Okay, yeah. Uh, in the previous slide, when you did select blocks from this, for example, previous cluster, is that separated by forward or is that part of that session? Uh, I, I don't know that part, but I was just using like within the user session. Like I didn't. Without this part of No, uh, no, no. Uh, the, this, is, the, this is stat. This is not no extension. Sorry. Yeah, I, I do know that. <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah, just that this is available. Uh, I, do, I don't know which version is available. I was just using the head of the tree, but yeah. Cool. So um, let's move on to the dynamic uh, shared memory part of uh, um, things. So there are scenarios which we really need uh, dynamic uh, shared memory, like parallel uh, query execution being one of them, where we have not allocated the memory in the beginning. So we can't use the you know, for, fork magic that we uh, rely on. We need some, some way in which we newly uh, allocate uh, this memory, then attach it to the, uh, the processes that are there. So uh, the way in which, uh, so there are two types of um, dynamic shared memory that is available, as the name suggests, there's DSM and DSA. Uh, so dynamic shared memory, uh, like DSM was uh, the, the one that first came. Um, so, and then DSA was built on top of that for more sophisticated operations, like if you want multiple DSM segments and want to manage the allocation better, things like that is where uh, DSA came into picture. Uh, in DSM scenario, uh, like if you look at the, um, look at the right, uh, right side of the um, uh, slide, the, this is how uh, the operations really happen. We um, uh, take a file, uh, give it an, uh, like an ID at the end, uh, like da da inside dev SHM. Then we uh, mmap that uh, into the system and then pass this ID uh, to the worker processes or the next set of processes which spin in. So they can then attach this uh, to their own uh, address space as well. So the secret source here is really uh, that shared memory attach and uh, making that happen. Here I'm uh, showing you something which uh, is not recommended <laughs> when you deal with things, uh, but uh, just enabling parallel query uh, by default and just running a select thing so that it spins off some workers, just an example. So as you can see, uh, it opens it, then mmaps it, and later when the query is over, it un uh, unmap uh, unmaps it and then unlinks it. So this particular uh, shared memory um, uh, file is what gets uh, mapped, so the processes will get uh, with each other. Uh, one of the uh, uh, like one of the salient problems that is there with this is that when you do this dynamic shared memory, the process mapping, uh, like in terms of address, will be different in different processes. Previously, we could have relayed on that, but here we need to actually make mechanisms to make sure that we have a different way in which we can map and figure out where the memory was. So in both DSA and DSM, this kind of works out fine, um, but uh, DSA has more uh, like friendly usage of uh, segments and things like that. Um, and it was uh, developed, both of them, like it, the original one, uh, I believe, was developed when we were starting to get to parallel queries. And parallel uh, hash joins, when we go to it, that's when uh, DSA uh, was developed as well. Um, so that's the way in which dynamic shared memory is dealt with. Uh, so we um, we crossed over uh, the shared memory, um, the static and the dynamic part of it, went through an example. 
Now we'll talk about how local uh, memory is operating. A local memory is like, uh, think of it as malloc when you do in a typical application, where you need objects to be allocated in the memory to make things happen. And that is where it's used. So um, Postgres offers this, uh, I would say, infrastructure uh, where there's something called memory context. And memory context has various APIs, right? Like alloc, realloc, uh, reset, delete, all of these APIs. And it, it is sort of an interface kind of model where there is memory context and then you have implementations of this. So a typical implementation of this is alloc set, uh, which is what is used in most cases. Um, then there are like specific implementations which folks have developed over course of time to improve uh, the memory management uh, part of it. Slab is one of them where we had to do like a large equally, uh, uh, when, we, when we are doing a large equally sized uh, objects, uh, slab is what we should be using. And uh, I believe uh, in logical replication, uh, we had used it uh, significantly uh, in the past. Um, the uh, one uh, important aspect which uh, comes in very handy is that uh, there is something called current memory context which always will point to your uh, current context that is there. Um, and I'll, I'll explain in the next slide why that becomes uh, important. So this is how um, the memory context itself is built with a hierarchy in mind. So the right side shows the top memory context which is what we start with. Uh, in every process that we build, we have top memory context, and then from there we have a child memory context from there, and uh, so on and so forth. We can go to uh, levels, multiple levels of this. So at any point in code, uh, so we don't have to pass the memory context as separate uh, function uh, parameters and things like that. It's all there declared uh, so that when, when, whenever you are in a particular function and then you want to look up what's the current memory context, you always have, uh, like I was saying, the current memory context. Uh, all of them is hierarchically tried in the way that uh, when you uh, get to a, from a parent, you can get to the children that have been allocated. The way that it, this comes in handy is that you don't have to manage the memory that if you had an error, you need to come back and free this up. Like you just can uh, free up the parent context at wherever you are and the children uh, will get freed as well. So this is already available within Postgres, so you don't, I mean Postgres core code, so you don't have to think about memory management uh, a lot of times. And the malloc portions of this, the internals of how the memory is managed and whether we should free it up, all of that is handled within the memory context, so we don't have to really do this. We, we can call the free thing, but uh, that uh, the implementation will determine what's needed. Uh, want to touch upon a bit on how exceptions are handled. Exception is not really uh, uh, exception handling uh, in, in other languages kind of exception, but I'm talking about if we had an error at a particular location, uh, we use this uh, uh, set jump uh, kind of mechanism where if it, it goes back into the stack at a certain point, it still will free up the memory because we would put, put hooks there which make sure that the set jump, uh, like uh, the capture of that, uh, the handler of that will make sure that we, uh, we free up the memory uh, there as well. Uh, the last point was what I mentioned earlier. Um, oh, sorry. The last point is another technique which we use where we don't, when we start allocating, if uh, we start allocating uh, the contents of this, like the memory context of this, until we get to a point where we, uh, we can move forward, we don't assign it to the parent uh, process. What that means is that, sorry, parent context, what this means is that we can handle the errors very easily. If you have an error, we can just free up the entire block instead of like uh, trying to free up one piece by piece. And at the end, uh, when we are safe and steady, we can do a setting uh, of parent context as well. So that's how um, this, this is uh, managed. Um, yeah, so that, that's the local memory context uh, part of it. Uh, before we move on to the kernel side, uh, questions? Yes.
Okay. So uh, the test environment, there is a uh, option to enable asserts by default, right? Like, and then, like for example, when I uh, change code, I enable them by default. And then when you test them, these things like get caught up. But like, as if someone has put the assert there, that's when <laughs> you would get it. So it's a little bit like context specific that we'll have to look at this case and then see it. But there is an option to enable this, like while compiling the. Uh, Nowadays, Mison is what we all use. So while configuring, we can set it and then uh, run it that way. Cool. Um, so because we have processes, uh, as is the case with anything in Linux, there is some amount of memory consumption that every process takes, something like the page tables, there's a memory for stack, and things like that. But I'd like to talk about uh, this uh, this concept of double buffering that uh, that typically happens in uh, the Postgres world currently. Um, so when when we talked about the buffer pool, uh, the the idea was that we would uh, you know have a cache for everything every content that was there uh, the, that we deal with from storage. Uh, but most of the times Postgres is on top of file system. So at that point in time. When we are dealing with, when we are reading from uh, storage, like reading a file, for example, it also gets cached in the uh, kernel uh, page cache. And this is one of those things where we have the, we potentially could have the same copy uh, in memory inside Postgres as well as inside kernel, right? Like page cache inside kernel and buffer pool inside Postgres as well. Uh, so that, like, it's sometimes very useful, uh, sometimes not very useful. Uh, but I just wanted to bring that topic here so that I can uh, show some of these uh, ways of debugging this. So basically, uh, Finco is uh, one of those uh, tools that you can use to uh, figure out the contents from the buffer pool. In this example, I'm looking at a, a table called my large table, and then I filled it up with some, uh, some large amount of data, recently written, and then um, looked up the Finco to look through the buffer cache. And uh, sorry, page cache of the kernel, and then uh, as you can see, the number of the uh, so when we we'll eventually look at the file system layout, the OAD of this will be what will be there in the file system. So that one, when we uh, look at the file node uh, relation, we can find that the uh, the pages are cached uh, appropriately uh, inside the page caches. Now, uh, off late. Uh, uh, at least a few years since we have been working on this thing about uh, making uh, Postgres to go to a place where we have asynchronous and uh, direct I.O. Uh, built in. Uh, both are things that we really need uh, eventually for better performing, uh, you know, like better performing Postgres. Uh, a lot of uh, the group in Microsoft, like we work on that, like Anders, Thomas, uh, Melanie, uh, for example work on it, uh, and uh, David too. So uh, when that direct I.O. comes, uh, what you will start to see is that this page caching is not um, like the, the, ca the pages in the cache that is shown on the right from the kernel will no longer be there, will no longer be there as well. Uh, I was planning to show a, a, a screenshot of that, but uh, <laughs> didn't get a chance to put it in. But uh, right now in uh, Postgres 16, you can enable direct IO in debug mode. Uh, then you will start to see uh, that uh, we no longer uh, cache it uh, inside the kernel. There are uh, performance aspects of this. It cannot be used directly. Uh, and that's the part where the development phases of Postgres is taking us through some, uh, some uh, project milestones where we'll get to a place where we have asynchronous I.O. and D.I.O. built in, and then we will solve some of these performance challenges with uh, buffer pool as well. So, um, Yeah, so that kind of concludes the type of memory. Uh, we talked about shared, we talked about private and uh, like local, and we talked about uh, kernel memory consumption. 
Um, we uh, will talk a bit about configuration. Uh, a lot of uh, talks here already covers a lot of this, so I'm not going to be comprehensive uh, around this. Just touching upon some things which really uh, are interesting and curious when it comes to memory management. So shared buffers is the first thing. It will determine the, the buffer pool aspect of it. Uh, make it big, then you might actually consume uh, memory in a way that a kernel itself won't have memory to do stuff uh, for, uh, for its page caching. So there needs to be a balance in that. That's the one thing to remember. But uh, some uh, tweaking uh, here could help as well in a lot of scenarios uh, when, when we have very I.O. bound uh, workload. Uh, we have workmem which typically is the internal uh, you know, like limits around this, but uh, the, the fact of the matter is there's really no limit in most cases because every process that kicks in, like, let's say parallel workers or every user session or partitions that kicks in, it thinks that workmem is its limit, right? Like, so that means that if you had three or four of them, like all four of them would be actually uh, you know, looking at the workmem. So in a uh, simple configuration, this, kind of works by setting the work mem, but you have to be aware of these other uh, corner cases to currently make sense on how much actual consumption uh, of memory is out there and what the limits of them are. Uh, huge pages is yet another thing. Uh, there is on, off, and try, uh, and uh, the, like on, off is like uh, what is obvious. Try is like it will try to allocate if there is huge pages available. If not, it will move on and try to do the regular allocation. The important thing to remember is that huge pages n might be needed to uh, be reserved in advance, and that will help you to make sure when, by the time Postgres comes up, it, it gets access to the huge pages uh, by default. Um, the next setting is something called overcommit setting. This is by default what Postgres uh, documentation and uh, is suggested. Um, uh, when you have a regular Linux machine, you don't have this setting on, and Postgres says, hey, set this up, kind of thing. But the thing to remember here is that uh, in a typical Linux system, when you uh, do a, let's say you do a malloc, and then you, um, you, know, you try to write to the malloc, that is when actually the pages would get uh, you know, faulted in and allocated uh, properly. And there is no limits to this. You can do like mallocs for a large amount, uh, until your virtual memory uh, stuff, but you could have a case where your physical memory is still, uh, you know, not used, and you'll be fine. But when we use this overcommit setting, uh, that is typically recommended in Postgres systems. If you do a malloc, and every time you do malloc, the memory gets reserved by the kernel. What that means is that Postgres would can expect the behavior where, when we are running out of memory we will end up in a scenario where malloc would return us error rather than a fault, right? Like out of memory fault kind of scenario. So that is the kind of expectation of this, that there is a more graceful behavior. Uh, somewhere, I think folks had the expectations that when a new user session connects and it's not able to allocate memory, it should be killed and stuff like that. But typically, if you run into this situation, then the entire thing uh, goes bad. But uh, the good part of this is that we won't have to actually do a lot of scenarios that we end up, we don't have to do recovery, right? Like that's where uh, it will be a more graceful shutdown because you get a, uh, get a proper error return from malloc. So that's the uh, story behind the setting, but something to be careful around when you are dealing with um, many, many instances of Postgres in a cloud environment. If you're setting this, there are uh, consequences of this, uh, so uh, especially in uh, low-end SKUs and things like that, so please be uh, aware of uh, the setting. No magic, yeah. Yep. Yep. So I can, uh, it can tell no more if there is actually memory is out there 
Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. yep. Yeah. But, but work work mem is tricky. That's the message I want to. I mean, typically when we configure it, we expect it to behave all fine. But there are scenarios where we are not calculating well. Max connections is not enough actually. But but I, I would say a typical user, we don't have to worry about it. But as we get to sophisticated users of let's say we had a lot of parallel queries going on. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There you go. Thank you. Yep, thank you. So um, a bit of uh, back-end debugging sort of thing, like you know, like things which we could use to debug some of these uh, things, right? Where actually our memory went, kind of scenario, right? Like uh, here is a couple of things we can use, which is one is uh, as I was explaining earlier, the shared memory allocations, the uh, PG shifts mem allocations view. Uh, so I've uh, I've uh, put that on the right, like there you can see. All the uh, shared memory allocations, like uh, it, it got uh, snipped at the end, but like all the shared memory allocations that potentially uh, could be happening, uh, uh, like uh, in in a process, you can get using this. Uh, you you will be able to understand like what statically and what dynamically these uh, these things will help you uh, to get a sense of it. Backend memory context is the local memory context that is there. Uh, the thing to remember here is that we don't we we will be getting for that particular connection like what's the backend uh, thing you can give send uh, uh, say that hey I want it for another process let's say a worker thread that is running you wanted to uh, figure out the, what the memory consumption of that is that also you can send but it will be logged inside uh, the system. Uh, so these two, uh, combining these two, you should be able to figure out what's going on in the system in, in general, right? Because allocations are happening in these two areas. Uh, this still doesn't cover the kernel side of things, like you still need some more magic to make that happen, but this should be good for us to debug a lot of issues. Uh, some tools and extensions like PG buffer cache is the extension I was demonstrating earlier, which can tell you uh, what is the content of the buffer cache that is there? Um, the PG Prevarm is another tool which uh, typically people use to preload uh, the uh, the tables into the uh, the buffer pool as well. Uh, PMap is another tool which you can use to actually map the entire process uh, on the right here and then figure out what is uh, you know allocated locally, what is allocated uh, like in shared memory uh, and things like that. Uh, so these are tools which when you end up in situations where uh, things are not going well, uh, life-saving uh, tools at the end of the day. Um, so um, now that we have covered some of the uh, fundamentals of all of this, let's talk a bit about uh, some of the projects. Uh, some of this like um, are um, ideas which are floating around. Uh, some, some of this have uh, uh, consensus. Uh, some of them don't have, they are very contentious uh, in the mailing <laughs> list. Uh, so just wanted to lay out uh, some topics uh, around this. So uh, the, th there is a patch which, will, uh, which is coming up in PG-17, which we did as an intern project in our group, and uh, Thomas uh, helped uh, guide this, and we are working on this, is to uh, get to a place where we can invalidate the buffer uh, cache, like if if... Uh, if this tool can be uh, like uh, it's it, it's part of the core uh, Postgres, you don't need extension, but then you can call this invalidate buffer cache, and then you can uh, get the buffer cache fleshed or uh, dealt with later. So this is not to be used in a user scenario kind of thing. This is more used in when you have to debug something, as well as this is a building block to some of the other things that we will talk about. So the next uh, topic uh, is like the memory uh, shrink and expand uh, scenario where right now everything is kind of like static if you have a buffer pool that is actually static when you want it later you still need to restart and throw away your context and build this thing all uh, later but uh, the the place where we could reach is that Postgres just stays on and you can just expand or you know like uh, shrink this memory and that's the idea behind this so we could use it in a let's say serverless environment where we want to decrease the usage of memory as we uh, as the more and more of these uh, uh, 
uh, user uh, interactions reduce, we can decrease the memory, and as the user comes in, we can increase the memory. So right now, uh, Postgres doesn't have such things. It's all uh, very static. So that's potentially one area that we could. Uh, overbooking is another scenario which comes up when you have a multi-tenant scenario and you want to make sure that uh, you can put two or three, uh, no, sorry, not, <laughs> not two or three, you can put multiple uh, instances of Postgres into one, let's say, uh, core node. And then you want to make sure that uh, the memory, when uh, some uh, one of these instances, we can free up and give it to the another instance and things like that, which involves a kernel at that point, which involves hypervisor at that point, and the whole stack. But this is uh, another area where uh, something like memory shrink expand uh, could be useful. And anyone interested in this space, please uh, let's talk. I'm, I'm very, very uh, uh, thrilled to talk about this to get it to uh, Postgres. Uh, memory accounting and limiting. Uh, this is a bit of a tricky situation that we really don't have a good way to limit uh, Postgres memory, right? In the sense that, let's say we want that to say this query should not be using beyond a certain memory, something like that. Some sophisticated limiting that we could use where we can manage the expectations of the users or wait till some memory is available, right, where other users are uh, uh, using the instance and things like that. So right now, that facility is not there. There are patches in the mailing list where discussions are going on, especially on accounting and limiting. Uh, but they have not yet uh, concluded, so we are still in the stages. Uh, SLRU was another uh, topic uh, which I touched upon earlier, where uh, could we combine SLRU into buffer pool and have just one single way to manage the, the things which are disk backing in memory. Uh, there are scenarios where we have caches. Uh, when we execute a query, we end up with caches, but we don't free up that well uh, on time. And that's another area we could do. Uh, there's a lot of performance improvements possible in allocation speeds. Every version gets it. PG-17 has a bunch of PALOC uh, allocation speed improvements, memory allocation speed improvements that are coming up as well. Uh, and uh, the other thing is like whether we could do more uh, sophisticated uh, buffer pool replacement algorithms. Uh, so those are uh, the project's ideas which uh, I want to spill out in the world and have folks uh, uh, look at it and let's collaborate uh, on this. Uh, so um, I just want to um, thank, uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for uh, coming to the session. <laughs> it's, it's been a long time since I've given a talk, so uh, I've been, uh, you know, thank you for <laughs> the, uh, the participation. Uh, I want to thank uh, our group uh, inside Microsoft, which, uh, which consists of both committers as well as contributors. Uh, so we have a, a group which focuses uh, solely on uh, making uh, improvements in Postgres, adding features and improvements, not only uh, on like, uh, like specific areas, but we do things like uh, CSED improvements, we do things like uh, really AAO, DAO, and things like that. So a whole spectrum of things we do, and I get to have fun with uh, my group here, and a lot of this has come from that, so thanks for thanks to them. Uh, special thanks to Thomas uh, Munro, David Rowley, and Anders Rowan, because they helped me uh, gaining the knowledge and kind of like uh, brainstorming on some of these uh, aspects. Uh, Teresa from Microsoft helped me uh, build the graphics around it, so thanks to all of them. Uh, thank you, and that's about it from the session. Thank you. Yes. So the uh, double buffering. Uh, um, do we encounter the double buffering for the huge pages also? Yes, I believe so. Yep. Okay, thank because you. Because the 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 page cache still has it, like when we take it from the uh, thing. I believe so. But yeah. okay.
Yeah, so uh, just a quick comment and then a quick question. Yep. Uh, the, the comment is one thing I wanted to just kind of mention about enable C asserts is that it also, when you do that, it also enables uh, zeroing out each of your um, allocation sets, your memory contexts, yep. when it clears them. So that gets rid, that allows you to turn um, problems into crashes. But my question was uh, you mentioned um, huge pages. Um, uh, have you seen any particular cases, uh, any particular parameters where huge pages make a particularly big uh, difference to performance, or is that something that, that, that that's maybe uh, um, uh, outside of your area of work? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, we do recommend that in general. Uh, I have not like dealt with a specific uh, workload which dealt with it, but. In the past, I've like I've read about workloads which you know like out there which benefits from this, so, but not directly dealing with it. Yeah. yeah, the older like databases, right? Like I mean the incumbents. Okay, cool. so. Krishna Kumar, as he was getting up on the stage, told me that this is the first time in 18 years yeah. that you're giving a talk. <laughs> and I told him that this is just like riding a bike. And I think that he proved that. It's just like riding a bike. So another round of applause for him, please. Thank you. Thank you.